I will call to order a uh, special meeting, the emergency communication task force, October 21st, 2020 at 6.34 PM. The first item, um, I, I'm hoping that you all received the minutes from our first meeting, which is August 16th. Can you verify that? If so, um, that's the first item is approving those minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes. I'll second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any abstentions? Me, I wasn't there. Any opposed? All right, so moved. I'm taking notes here at the same time. All right, so the next item is a presentation. Um, and so we have uh, Tiffany, Tiffany, I apologize. I don't want to uh, do harm to your last name. Um, Minyaka? Minchaka. Minchaka uh, from Code Red. So Tiffany is going to give us a presentation and overview of the Code Red um, on solve system. So Tiffany, go ahead. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, what I'm trying to do here is share my screen, but it's okay. mentioning nope, that the host is disabled. So. I can do that. I appreciate be that. Able Thank to you. do that now. Excellent. And if you'll just confirm that you're seeing the Onsob website, am I sharing the correct? screen. Perfect. Yes. Um, so thank you very much, folks. Um, with my presentation, I do try to make it as interactive as possible. So um, at any point in time, if you do have questions, or if you'd like me to dig deeper into certain sections, please feel free to stop me. Um, I do, I am in the system all day, every day. So I do have a tendency to go through um, areas a little quicker uh, than some folks might be comfortable with. So um, I promise you, you will not hurt my feelings if you need to stop me. Um, but I do bring us to our OnSolve website first, because uh, for those folks that are not familiar with Code Red, OnSolve is our parent company, and Code Red is our product geared towards state and local governments. So underneath the OnSolve umbrella, we do have a variety of different uh, software solutions that we offer to folks, including um, mass notification, which uh, Code Red is under, uh, but also we do uh, like incident management and risk intelligence um, as well. And all of that can be found on our website if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us um, as a company, what we do and why we do it. Um, but at OnSolve, within the past year alone, we've sent out over 2 billion notifications. Um, we have been credited, uh, one of our products or multiple of our products have been credited with helping to locate over 3,500 missing persons. We are a global company, so we are in over 170 70 uh, countries worldwide, and we cover about 50% of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, so not only local, uh, state and local governments, but we uh, also um, cover medium, small, and large businesses. Now on this website, I am gonna bring up our sign-in page. So I'd mentioned earlier the different software solutions and offerings that we have. And on our login page, it gives you just a little overview of those different offerings. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the code red side because that's really what we would like to highlight today. Every um, system and subscription gets unlimited system users. So uh, when the town, if should the town purchase a Code Red subscription, you can have uh, multiple different departments benefiting from this tool. Everything from police, fire, to um, your town administration, but also um, we've seen folks give access to like the local librarian. If she has programs and offerings that your community would like to be engaged with, you can have it on your website when folks are signing up for uh, Code Red. At the same time they're signing up for your emergency alerts, they can be signing up for those additional offerings as well. And then that particular particular user could have a limited view of your system. So it's not um, every single user sees everything. You can really restrict access um, based on that person's role. So I'm going to go ahead and sign into my system. And since I am in a demo environment, I'm going to have access to everything. So you're going to probably see what a full administer, administrator would see uh, rather than one of those restricted views. But know that, like I said, we can, um, you know, get this down to what that person's role is if necessary. So on the dashboard, 
we have the quick launch panels highlighted in red. And we do that because it's one of the most important panels you're going to see on your screen. It's where you would either quickly select a notification that you've had pre-created and um, are ready to launch immediately or something that you're building either for the future or to send out right away. So in my quick launch, I have a variety of different pre-created um, examples here. So um, you can use your tool for pretty much anything underneath the sun. There is only two restrictions and it's per the FCC on what um, you couldn't use a tool like Code Red for. The first would be you cannot solicit money from your recipients. And the second is you cannot tell people who to vote for. Other than those two things, if you can imagine it, you can uh, use the tool. And um, you know, regarding the, the money um, that I mentioned earlier, so we have seen unique cases where um, you know, utility Utilities, uh, public utilities would uh, want to notify folks before any kind of shutoff takes place that there might be a delinquency in their, um, on, on their account and that they should settle that in order to avoid interruptions. So as long as there's not actually a dollar amount mentioned in that message to those um, recipients, you're good to use your tool for something like that as well. And so just to give you an idea of how other communities are using the system, so if you have severe weather alerts that, um, let's say, whiteout conditions. If we know that we're expecting a really bad storm, we have a pre-created um, message in the system for uh, whiteout conditions, avoid, um, you know, being on the road, stay at home. Um, you can have that pre-created and then in the event that you need to send it out, you would just simply select it on here and it would go out either town-wide or um, if you needed just a certain subsection of your town, maybe areas of vulnerability. Um, some examples would be like a flood zone that I mentioned here or an evacuation EPZ zone. So if you have chemical plants or anything like that where you would have a predetermined area. I'm going to go ahead and select one for my um, critical incident and select launch. And since I've had this already pre-created, my message and my um, audience is already there, it's going to give me a recap before I launch. So how many phones, text, and email and emails am I about to send out? But why I'm showing you this page is because you can see the caller ID displayed pretty well here. So with the caller ID, every Code Red uh, subscription gets two caller IDs. The first uh, caller ID would be for emergency alerts. Highly recommend that when you're um, promoting the system to the public, letting them know this is the solution that we're using for emergency alerts, that we explain to them that this number is always going to be displayed on their phone for those emergency alerts save it in your phone. Because um, when that number is dialing, that means that there is something that requires their immediate attention or their immediate action. Um, a second number will be given to the town for more community engagements, general updates, so they can clearly distinguish between the two. Um, now, why? what benefits you get from these numbers are, you know, besides the fact that they know, um, you know, what's an emergency, what's a general, is that a callback feature is already enabled with these calls our IDs. And what that would mean is like in the event that you send out a notification and maybe a resident picked up that line, but they're in an area where there's a lot of background noise, they're not able to hear that message or they're not getting that message um, as clear as they would like. Instead of calling your, um, you know, your police department, your fire department back and asking them, okay, what, I missed this call, what is it regarding? We can again educate the public to let them know if you miss a call, just call that number right back and you'll hear the very last message that was sent to you from Code Red. And you can play that back as many times as you need to get that important information. So great benefits there. Um, now we do understand that there are going to be situations where you would much rather a local number display on the line for your folks. Um, so you can change this at any point in time by just clicking on that lock and then that opens up that number for you to be able to modify and change it to a local number. Now why I caution this, I know that it's a, it's a very um, enticing option is that what we're seeing in the industry specifically with cell phone providers is that they are doing a large crackdown on spam. Um, so if a number is registered to the town but it's being issued through a code red um, system or dialers, there is a good chance that that might look like spam to those cell phone providers and they'll block it or um, they'll send a, a spam alert to that cell phone um, recipient and there's that potential for them to ignore the message. If you leave it 
as our standard code red um, emergency caller ID and the general, if you make no changes to it, because we work closely with those cell phone providers, they understand the industry that we're in and the service that we provide. We have an A rating with all of the nation's providers. So that call will go through every single time and you'll never have to worry about it being marked as spam. Now, we also have another feature that I just wanted to highlight on this screen call uh, for the launch expiration. So we know with a tool like Code Red, um, chances are you're gonna have some standard operating procedures in place on when it's appropriate to use Code Red as opposed to when it's not. You might even have some time restrictions on when those notifications can get sent out to the public. Um, so let's say we have an SOP in place that said for a certain type of alert, we do not notify our residents past seven o'clock at night and we're at 6.45 right now. If we wanted to try and get this message out um, and we can tell the system, okay, within the next 15 minutes, try and call as many numbers as you can because we still wanna get people involved in this and engaged with the message, but we wanna be respectful of those SOPs. So you can go ahead and set an expiration where the system will stop dialing after a certain point. Another um, reason that you might want to use a, a launch expiration would be in a situation where there's rapidly changing information. Um, let's say we had a missing persons, um, we sent out a notification, but within you know a certain amount of time, we're going to probably reissue an update. So we can let the system know, okay, within 30 minutes, get as many people as we can, and then past that point, I'm going to be sending out a secondary update to that uh, alert anyway, so go ahead and stop dialing. So that would be this section here. Now, um, not all emergencies or messages are gonna be something that you can plan for. So if something's happening on the fly and we wanna get out an alert, we can easily just build from the same area by selecting that option. The first um, question, and, and we do try to make this as easy as possible um, in terms of a cognitive load of your users as possible. So, um, cause chances are, uh, if there's a major situation happening, you as a system administrator, not only are you tasked with sending out an alert to notify the public, but you might have an, a, a multitude of other tasks that you're taking, um, you're taking on at the same time, or you yourself might be involved in this uh, notification. If you're evacuating, if you're telling folks to shelter in place because, you know, a tornado's about to, you know, cross through the town, you can, um, at the same time, you can get this notification out without having a lot of a strain on your shoulders. So we do show you step-by-step step what section of the alert that you're at. First question is gonna be, well, what type of alert is this? Um, is it an emergency or more of a general community um, engagement? And you as the town get to make that determination um, based on what you believe. I know we like to say a good rule of thumb for emergency is anything that's threatening to life or property. And that's a very broad um, term because some agencies might not think a boil water notice is an emergency, but if there is somebody in that area that is dependent on that water for formula or somebody with a compromised immune system that has that potential of being injured due to drinking that water or having some kind of um, illness or um, injury from that, then absolutely use that emergency database. It's gonna be larger than your general database because when folks are signing up for your alerts on your registration page, they have the opportunity to opt out of general alerts where they do not have that opportunity with emergency. If they're signing up on that page, they're automatically in that database. So it is gonna be larger. And then of course, um, that caller ID that I mentioned earlier that's being displayed on the phone. So once you make that determination, you just select that on the screen, hit continue. And now the next portion of our build is gonna be our audience. So who are we trying to reach? You have a couple of different ways that you can create an audience. If this is town-wide, so this is affecting everybody in the town, we wanna get to reach as many people as we can, you have an all call option. This can be a public facing all call or staff and employees um, or a combination of both. So in making that selection, you just check the box of what's relevant for this notification and hit continue. 
before you even get to that next spot, you're going to get a, an attention notification. It's going to tell you that you're going to reach every single piece of data that you have within your boundaries. You actually have to hit OK in order to continue. So this is a, a good, we're all about checks and balances and um, making, giving you new warm, fuzzy feelings every step of the way that you know and you're comfortable and confident that what you're doing is actually what you're intending. So it's telling you, OK, everybody, if you only want a small subset of the, the town or maybe a geographic target area instead, just go ahead and hit cancel the back button. It lets you know right over here on the right hand side that you have not made a selection yet. Nothing has been selected. So you're good. Um, again, with the mapping, if you wanted to do just a targeted area, we could easily pull up the map here. It is going to show you, I actually zoomed in here um, to where, where your headquarters or your town hall is, but of course you can zoom out if you want a, a, night, a bigger view of your town. Um, you can also switch between street and satellite view if it ever becomes necessary where you actually want to see those structures. Um, you can switch between those two. And you can also toggle to full screen so that you're able to build a larger area if needed. And you can always move using your mouse or um, and zoom in and out using either the rolly pen on your mouse or the um, selection tools over here. Now we have four different shapes that you can create down here at the bottom. The first I'm going to start with is a polygon. So um, why the polygon is my favorite is because it, it's one of the easiest to use. You simply click on the map on where you want that first point of your shape to be, drag out your mouse, and it's creating this line for you automatically. So you just tell it, okay, this is the distance for that first side of the shape that I would want. By clicking again, it stops the first line and gives you now this second line to continue to draw. You just keep clicking and dragging your mouse until you've defined the entire area that's being affected. And then it shows you on the screen, you double click to close. So now this is the whole area that's being notified. Nothing outside of the shaded area will be alerted. You can have multiple shapes on the map at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the rectangle option for my next shape, and it's a drag and drop. So I would select on my screen where I want that first point of the shape to be, hold down my mouse and drag it out. And now I've defined a second area that's being notified. And what um, you're essentially doing with two shapes on the map is that you're notifying these two areas and only the shaded areas with the exact same message. So you don't have to worry about sending multiple alerts if multiple areas of your, your town are being affected by this um, alert. You can easily- Tiffany, oh, go ahead. sorry to interrupt. Just one question on this specific thing. Um, the database of recipients we would have in our system already for this scenario would more likely be home phones or it would be their cell phones if they live at those addresses, correct? It, would, it depends. It would be a combination of both. So um, what we offer with our subscription is a starting database for the town. So usually that starting database is going to be the commercially available uh, information from white and yellow pages. So those landlines, those business numbers, um, but we also work with the leading credit bureaus to purchase data on your behalf for um, the folks that are filling out like credit card reports and we're able to get that information. So sometimes cell phone information will be in there, um, but it's it's not a guarantee and we don't um, mark it as a cell phone because we're getting it from a second source. Of course. So then my last question on that is that, is there any option to do a geofencing um, work with the cell phone company. So any cell phone passing through that area uh, not okay. registered as a recipient, would they get the notice? Like if we had, uh, you know, a hazmat release, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's some sort of a chemical release and we want to try to get everyone in that area. I realize that's kind of pie in the sky, um, but is that available? Yes. So um, there is two things that I would want to touch base on that with uh, regarding that. So we do have a code red mobile alerting app that's available with all subscriptions. It's free for you um, as a town to send to and it's free for your citizens to download. It's one of the most downloaded um, emergency management or emergency alerting apps in the um, Google Play and, and Apple Store. So it is a very um, 
well received uh, alerting and that allows you to send push notifications to devices that would otherwise not be in your uh, database. For instance, if um, somebody in the town of Mansfield, who happens to be a code red community, they have the app downloaded, they're traveling through your area. If you as a code red community issue out an alert through the app, they're getting notified even without being in your database, because it's taking the geographic um, okay. uh, location of the phone. There's a second option that's available. And this would require that the town um, work with FEMA to apply for their IPAWS program. So that's the integrated um, public alert and warning system. And that does have to go through the state in order to get approved. FEMA would uh, um, you know, approve your application as well. Once you go through that process, we do have IPAWS integration capabilities with Code Red. And that is a push notification to devices. So if you've ever gotten an Amber alert on your phone. Um, chances are you didn't register for it, but you're getting an alert. Um, that's because it's it's a chip inside of every smartphone that's been, I think, since 2005. Um, every smartphone since then has that chip in it, and you would get that based on your coordinates. So there are ways of doing that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's exactly what I was looking for. Perfect. But again, that iPods, you do have to apply through FEMA. And mm -hmm. then if you do get approved, then we'll work with you to get that in your, because uh, we don't want you to pay for something that you might not get approved for. So um, as yes, long sir. as you go through that process. Thank Perfect. You. And then, um, so we have a circle option as well, which is very similar to the rectangle and then it's drag and drop. You get to determine what the distance uh, radius is in miles. And then um, lastly is gonna be that freehand response or freehand drawing. So you would just press down on your mouse, draw out the area that we, we need to notify. And then now we have all of these different shapes. You can see over here just briefly that a little portion of that, sh those two shapes um, overlap. You don't have to worry about your folks getting double notified um, because Code Red actually has embedded in its system a, G a deduplication process. So um, that way we'll recognize for this single alert that that phone number has already been in the list and we won't notify it more than that once for that single alert. And then we have a final tool listed down here at the bottom called the quick radius. So this is really great in those instances that you'd mentioned like a hazmat or um, a missing persons or um, something where we would need just a quick uh, defined area around a, a, a starting point. So we'll say half mile radius here. I select quick radius as my option. And then I just click on the screen of where I need that shape to start. It automatically draws out that shape for me. There's no guesswork involved. It's a, a way for me to get through that process that much quicker. And you can also, um, find locations. So if we had an incident happen at a specific location, we wanted to notify folks within a certain radius, you can um, simply enter in that address. If you don't have the exact address, you could do intersections of two streets, and then just define what the city, your state will default automatically to uh, Connecticut. I just happen to be based out of Florida. So that's why it defaults to Florida for me. Um, but you would be able to move through that process and get that location pinpointed. And you can also load and save areas as well. If you have shape files already predetermined of areas of vulnerability within the town, like flood zones, um, you can easily load those shape files, have them saved. And then in the event you need to load them, um, they're available to you in this load areas with that name that you associated with it. So it's easy for you to simply select here. Okay, um, now there's another area down here that I just wanted to briefly call your attention to. It's the update calls. And why um, I, I reference this in all of my demos is again, I'm all about giving you that confidence and that um, you know warm fuzzy feelings that you are doing everything right. Um, I'm sure we've all been made aware of incidences and then you know not too uh, distance past where um, you know notifications have gone out of a system like similar to Code Red and it been a test notification, but it actually went out to the public. Um, so being able to do those checks and balances and know what environment you're in versus a live versus a test environment, updating your calls here will give you a total count of how many recipients you're going to reach within that shape. So how many phones, texts, and emails are you expecting to be able to send this alert to? Now, why that's important is at the final stage of this message creation, you're going to get a recap. So again, it's going to give you that phone, text, um, and email count. Matching those two numbers up gives you that confidence 
that you did everything right, that this is exactly what you're intending to send. Now, um, if I had a total countdown here of 50 and I get to that final step and I'm seeing 800, that could be an indication to me that maybe I made a selection, um, I over, um, I, I made a shape that I wasn't expecting and I need to go back and make corrections. So nothing leaves your system without a launch code. So if you get to that final page, you want to go back at any point in time, you can and nothing's left. So um, since I'm in a data and or my uh, demo environment, I'm not going to pull any data, which is great. Um, but I do want to exit out of here to show you the contact group area uh, before continuing on. So does anybody have any questions about the mapping piece of Code Red, what we've seen so far? No? Okay. So let me delete that off and exit out of here. Again, nothing's been selected. It lets me know here on the right-hand side. So let me go ahead and select the contact group area. Now, this is a double-click interface. It lets you know you need to double-click inside of each of these boxes to see the information. So I'm going to double-click here. It's going to show me all of the contact groups I have access to. Now, um, what we mean by contact groups are any groups that you've created within your system that either you allow your public to join or um, lists that you've created for your staff and employees. And all of them are going to be listed in this area. You can search through this by, you know, simply trying to give a portion of that name if you have a large list here. Um, otherwise, I'm going to scroll through it a little bit just to give you ideas of how other communities are using their systems. So if you have any aging at home um, programs that you offer to your citizens, that could be a public facing group that your recipients can then add themselves into. And whenever you want to give updates related to those programs, you have a list of everybody that wanted to get those alerts. So all you would have to do is select that group and be able to send your alert out to them. Um, some other different use cases would be dog updates. If there's dog licensees or um, you know rabies clinic, um, anything that you're making available to them and they wanna sign up for those updates. Believe it or not, um, folks also wanna sign up for like missing pets. If there's a, a dog that you know got out of its um, yard and, and there's a message that goes out and you know communities um, really, really close with their pets and wanna make sure that they return that to their family, um, you can, they can sign up for those types of alerts. Election reminders and updates, um, meetings for public meetings. If we want to go ahead, public hearings, they can sign up for those, public health, and so on. Now, some lists that I have in here for those internal would be fire department, police department employees, parks and rec. And I'm going to go ahead and select the police department. I use this often in my demos. Um, and, and it's not excluded to just the police department. But in the police department itself, there are um, many employees that have different certifications associated with them, as well as different skill sets. Um, so inside and when you're creating those lists of employees and staff within the system, you can also associate what we call tags, but are basically qualifiers or filters. So if I ever needed to filter down this large group to only a small subset of this group, so maybe within the police department, I have an incident that's taking place right now where I need an officer that can speak a second language so they can speak Spanish. Um, I can tell the system, okay, out of the police department, try to um, get me all of the officers that can speak Spanish with this alert. So I'm qualifying this large group down to a small uh, subset of the group. Now, individual contacts here. So we have seen in the past where let's say there is a, a situation happening and we're geographically targeting an area to let folks know, okay, we're asking you to shelter in place. There's police activity. Um, doing that, like I said, will only notify those people that are within that um, shaded area that you've defined. Now, there might be other members of your team that don't reside or don't um, have the, or registered within that area that still need to know. So Erica, for instance, if you need to be aware of this event because you get stopped on the street, people are asking you questions about it, you don't want to be blindsided. So in those cases, um, you can either, one, there's an always contact list on within Code Red. It's a, an option there that you can have a certain amount of your town administrators on that list. So every single time an alert goes out of code red, regardless of whether you're in that geographic area or whether you're in that contact group, you're getting notified. So that's a way of you to be able to keep the integrity of the system um, and to also be notified when an alert's going out. But if it's just like a one-off or you, you just want to add an individual, you can easily do that in a list and that all of the 
the employees that you have listed here will display. I can easy, easily select Erica and add her to my notification. And then at this point, I have my police department, all the officers that speak Spanish, and then Erica is going to be notified. So I'm going to go ahead and select done. And again, over here, warm, fuzzy feelings. It's telling me the only selection that I've made, even though I've gone through all of these different areas, is that contact because that's what I've confirmed. Now, you can name and save in your system as you go. It's not required. We don't want to prevent you from being able to take that next step, especially in an emergency by trying to associate a name with this. However, if you did want to use this in the future, um, maybe this group is someone I call to often, I give this a name, and now whenever I need to notify them again, it's available in my drop-down box. It just saves you those extra seconds, um, and when an emergency that happens, that could really uh, you know, make that difference. So you can easily have those saved and ready. Otherwise, just go ahead and continue to the message because you're ready for that next step just like before, anything that you have pre-created. So um, I have some active shooter examples here, building evacuations, boil wa uh, water notices, critical incidents, anything that you imagine that you could need and you have a message um, already you know, scripted for, go ahead and save it in your system. You know, it, It'll save you, like I said, those extra seconds in the event that you need it. Creating a new message though is pretty easy as well. You just simply select the create new message. You as an agency get to determine what type of distribution path you want per message. So um, if you have a notification going out that you only want to send out to emails, you can easily just select email and that's the only uh, method that's going to be disseminated to those folks, um, anybody that signed up through email. If you want phones, text and emails, you just make the selections of what you want. Okay, so we don't limit you on that. It, it's definitely, we want you to be able to gauge what your population will respond to most often. Now, my personal recommendation is if this is a true emergency, please use every option available to you at your disposal. And I say that because not one just, you know, certain path is best for everybody. Um, phone calls are really great if you need to get people's attention in the middle of the night, wake them up, whereas a text and an email they might not wake up for. Um, so if we have a tornado bearing down, we need people to take shelter or get into the innermost uh, you know, room in their, their home. Yeah, let's, let's use all uh, methods and phone calls is probably going to be the best. But personally for me, um, if you're trying to get a hold of me for a message, and this actually happened real world, um, where a notification was going out for a suspect that had robbed a, a local um, convenience store, and he had an AK-47, he was not too, too far from where our office headquarters is, to notify folks just through phone, you're missing people like me who have their cell phone off to the side, it's on mute when uh, during business hours, but I'm in front of my computer all day, every day. If you would have sent an email, I would have saw that in, within seconds and taken action where if you only did that one path, you had the chance of missing me. So definitely wanna make sure that you use all of those options at your disposal. I'm gonna highlight a few here. So that primary voice is gonna be that main message that goes out to all your landlines and your cell phones through the voice message. Um, email, pretty standard. Text is gonna be pretty standard. And then that mobile app that I'd mentioned earlier. So that app that folks will have downloaded on their phone, they won't have to be a resident within a geographic area, but if they're physically located in that area and you send out an alert to the mobile app, they're getting a push alert to their phone, letting them know, hey, you're, you're in an area that has a code red message, open up your app to see what's going on. Um, so highly, highly recommend that. Um, I do a lot of traveling, at least you know, pre-COVID I did. And um, I have that on my, my phone and it's, it's amazing the amount of information I can get no matter where I am. And then- Anthony, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Are, there any, are there any restrictions on the app? Meaning like, are there in-app pur purchases for the end user? Or if we purchase, they get every notification we push out? Or if they're in an area where um, there's code red? Okay, um, so there is no, in-app um, purchase for them. They don't have to worry about that. 
it does um, require that you actually send a notification out to the app in order for them to be alerted. So if you send out a phone call, it's not automatically going to get distributed out through the phone, uh, through the app. You actually have to make that selection here and include the message. And once you've done some type of text um, in there for it to display on the phone, it'll automatically um, include any kind of voice component that you had as well. So they can not only listen to it, but also read what you've sent out. But it does have to be selected in your message or like your yeah distribution and then um, on the email and the text here you can see that there's a secondary option that kind of drops down from those if you just want to send a standard email and text message having that selected you're good if you select the allow replies you are activating a feature in the system called two-way response um, or two-way messaging so what this does is that in the event that you are sending out let's say um, we're activating our special team we need them to tell us you know are you fit and able for duty when is your estimated time of arrival so that first question is going to be a yes or no but then i want them also to do a freehand response to me of when they're arriving what's you know what's their eta so activating that will give that recipient the ability to send you a message in response okay now i have a a pre-created message with that two-way response so i'm going to go ahead and pull that up now to show you what that looks like so you can see the email text the allow replies so within the email um, it is going to default to what my username email is if you would prefer um, your recipients not to see your uh, you know town issued email you can always change that to a no reply if needed your sender your subject line is completely customizable um, as well so if you want this to be more relevant to what the actual event itself is you can change that here and then um, within the text and the email for the response highly recommend that you give them just a brief snapshot of what's happening so in this example it's a mock fire drill i'm evacuating a portion of my building um, and then i need yes or no responses from my recipients on whether they're safe and out of the building um, if the answer is no i need them to provide me with additional information like where they're located so i can let first responders know now um, within the text and the email portion be very um, you know brief in your explanation of what's happening and then always prompt them to click on the link that's being provided to them now why the link is important um, is because it's the direct connection between that message and your system so when that person opens that message you're seeing when they've opened it um, when they respond it's reflecting in your system of what that response is so it's really important and that's why i recommend that you give them just a brief snapshot and then tell them click on the link because once they do open up the link, uh the link this reply section that you filled out is where the meat and potatoes of that message is going to be and it's going to give them instructions on what is as needed from them so my message here is evacuating the building due to a fire um, I need to know if you're safe and out of the building. If your answer is anything but yes, uh, you know, I need you to tell me where you're located. So I've put all of that in here. You can determine whether or not you want it to be a yes or no response. Maybe you're just sending out a meeting reminder and you don't need yes or no response, but you might need to know, um, you know, if somebody's bringing anything or if they've uh, received minute notes or anything like that. You can just have a text box for them to be able to supply you additional information and not necessarily yes or no. You can make the those determinations and then um, you can set a time limit on this as well so if you're getting a headcount for a meeting then you definitely you might want that out there for 24 hours for people to be able at their leisure to make those responses back to you and you get that appropriate headcount um, but if this is a you know a situation that's rapidly evolving I need to know within 15 minutes if you're um, you know out of that building or not uh, anything outside of that 15 minutes you know it's it's no longer going to be viable information to me you can make that determination here all right, so at this point, I'm ready to continue to my launch. But before I do, does anybody have any questions about any of the distribution paths? We do have um, capability. So if you're active on your social media channels like Twitter or Facebook, we can integrate with those um, those portals or those options as well. And at the same time, you're sending out phones, texts, and emails, you could be you know, posting to your channels at the same time. And then we had mentioned iPods earlier. This is where you would create that iPods alert at the same time you're, you're making those other messages. You could be sending out that push notification through iPods as well. Okay. Does the um, 
is to serve within. Does the tool um, allow responses to um, telephone calls or TVD? Like if we need something to be acknowledged and they don't have email or text capability? Th th that's a great question. So um, there's a couple of different ways that they could do a response through phone call. Um, in your actual message itself, you could give them a prompt to say, um, for this response, press the one key. For this response, press two. Um, and then you as the end user in your statistics, you will see those dial press um, that they've made. So you'll be able to make that determination. We also have an option inside of the system called Team Builder, and that's just for phone call responses. Um, and why that area is separate is um, it's, it's used as a way for you to be able to do like ordered list. It's for internal staff and employees. And we understand that certain times, like if we have overtime availability, we might have to give it to senior staff members first. So we have to create a list that the system will then dial in that um, respective list order and you can create that you can um, get those yes or no responses and you can even set a quota so if I had one overtime shift available and it's you know slowly going through that list to ask them who wants it the second someone says yes it'll stop dialing so nobody after that um, you know recipient will get the alert you already have your one confirmation so that is another area of the system as well and that's included with all subscriptions thank you you're welcome. That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and continue to that last option of sending this alert out by selecting continue to launch. Now, um, if I had mentioned earlier, you might not need this message to go out right away. You might be creating it for a future event. Maybe we have some road construction or construction that we know ha is happening down on Main Street. And we want this to schedule to go out Monday morning to give everybody just an update. Like, hey, remember, um, stuff's going down. You might want to take uh, alternative routes. So you can schedule this to go out at future dates and times. You would just simply tell the system what date and what time you need this to go out. And then automatically, um, the system will do that on that date and time. You don't have to log back in. You don't have to do anything else. The system will take care of it for you. Um, however, if you need something to go out right now, there is a launch now option. We still have the option for expiration if we needed to restrict this past a certain you know, threshold or you know, minute time frame. Um, otherwise, every single one of your system and user system administrators are going to be given a launch code. Nothing leaves your system without that final confirmation code, which is your launch code. It's going to be a five digit code. It's never going to change. Um, so you could easily have that either memorized or have it um, on a secure app in your phone where you can access it to be able to send that alert out. Um, but once you've confirmed that code and that launch is ready to go, you just simply select that option here. Setup is complete. So within seconds of sending out this alert, I'm going to get live statistics that pop up. If I had sent out a phone call with this message, it would show me in real time who's um, answering that call, what dispositions am I receiving, is this um, delivered live versus an answering machine if I'm running into any type of operator intercepts. All of that would be displayed on the screen. And then it also gives you the option to stop a launch. So if we sent this out to the entire town, we just got updates that the situation has resolved. Instead of you know letting that complete its course, if it was still in the process, you could have easily stopped that launch and it would no longer dial any numbers that weren't in queue. And let me go ahead and, and bring up my email real quick so you can see what that, um, that message looked like. So I got my email. Again, it was that fire drill. I let my recipients know, okay, guys, click on that link because that's where that response center is going to be. And I recommend that, especially for the first couple times when people are getting used to this, um, this tool to know that that's a really important thing to do. And then it'll tell them who sent this message, when they sent it, and then the meat and potatoes of that message is listed here. So I, as the recipient, would then just simply answer. And then down here at the bottom, I would submit. And then it'll let me know as the recipient, okay, you've done everything needed, nothing else is required, you're good to go. Now me as the system administrator, from the, the statistics from that same launch, I would view the contact. So it'll tell me who, who did I reach for this message, their phones, text, emails, all of that's displayed here. But those replies are going to be what's important for this particular alert. It shows me what the original message was, what um, information I'm getting 
what I'm receiving. So I, Erica, thank you very much for replying there, but it shows that she replied, the date and time that she replied. If she had included any additional information that would display here. Same with Tiffany, she replied via her email. It, it connects to that. She replied with a yes, and this is the date and time that it was, um, that response was received. So if you ever needed an after actions report and you needed an export of all of the people you contacted, dates and times, what their additional information is, you can easily export that using the export option as well. Perfect. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it's just because you're not showing it, but um, at a 911 center that I used to um, supervise, we had eight different contact options or eight different methodologies that our messages went out to. And it was email and text like you're showing, but we also had um, social media platforms and a website that we would drive the message to. And so the community understanding was already, had already been shared and the community was trained that if you get an alerting message or if you're wondering what happened with an alert, if it's resolved, you can always go to this website that's alert.thecommunity.org or whatever, um, which would, might be an option for a town like Willington to have a page like that, which could be the the always updated information. So when you push a message out like this, it goes to all those different things and it has the line at the bottom. For more information, go to alert.willingtonct.org or whatever. Um, or if we do administrative messages, we could have a different web, web location for that. And maybe the message that goes out just says, please go to um, messages.willingtonct.org um, without tying up the system with the, trying to put in all the details of the message. Is that available within your system? No, so with the actual hosted websites that you're um, you mentioning here, no. So what we have, the different distribution channels would be phones, text, emails, um, Twitter and Facebook, iPods, um, and then you have these, you know, the two-way channel was really just my highlight of those yes or no responses for um, your internal staff and employees. But if you did want something hosted on your website, we do have a website widget that would display the very last, uh, the five last messages that you had sent out through the Code Red mobile alerting app. So that geographic area that was being targeted, what your message was through both your voice file and your email, and there would be a record of what is being sent out. So your recipients don't necessarily have to be subscribed. Um, if they're visiting your website often enough, you can have that displayed there and they can be informed that way as well. So there is an option for a website. It's just not one that we would, um, that we host. It would be a, a widget to, and, it, and you can include into your website. Okay. So I think that actually, I think that actually for, in my question is a yes on all of those really. Okay. Because what I was saying is, can you push to like Facebook and Twitter, which mm -hmm. is, yes, you can. And can you push to a website? We can host huh. a website. Can you just okay. a website? Yes. Then yes, you okay. can have your messages be displayed on that website. Yes, sir. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so perfect. And um, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here. There's one last area that I wanted to highlight um, to, to show you. This would be in the event that you're launching from a computer. So you're either it's a desktop, a laptop, you're, you're sending out a notification. This is the interface that you will see. Um, I also want to show you what it will look like on a mobile because we do allow you that mobile launching capability as well. So Code Red um, has two apps. The first one is going to be that citizen facing app where they can have it downloaded and no matter where they're located, if they're in a, an affected area um, where, with a Code Red message, they're getting that push alert. This would be for your system administrators to send one out. Um, so the same username and password that got them access onto the desktop version will get them access into the app. They would just simply sign in. Now this is um, more of a slideshow, so it's not as interactive as I, I would hope it to be, but um, I'll definitely make sure that I highlight the, the areas imp of importance. So it shows you here that you can build a brand new scenario. So something that's not pre-created and we need to get something out really fast. If you have pre-created scenarios, so that message has already been defined, the area that we wanna reach um, has been defined, you can easily launch one of those. So here's a list of some of the ones that we've had pre-created. Let's go ahead and select the burn ban. Now with this burn ban, I'm gonna get that total of how many phones, texts, and emails. I can see the details of that message. I can hear that voice file before it's actually sent out. I can confirm the email, the texting, all of that information is correct. And then once my final step would be just to simply enter in my launch code to send it out. And then it'll let me know in real time 
what the the statistics are so how many phones are being answered live versus answering machine and so on and then you can see those details here now um, another area of the system that i want to highlight is the record my voice option um, so we've seen this used um, where maybe Erica, we want you to be that voice of the code red system. So every time that there's an alert that goes out, we want the citizens to recognize that when your voice comes on the line, it's an important message that they need to take notice, take action. Um, and you want that to just be something that they become uh, you know, familiar uh, with. You can, instead of actually sending this out yourself, if you needed to record a message, you could easily do that by using the microphone on your, your mobile device, whether it's a tablet or a cell phone, record your message, and then somebody, um, you know, let's say at the police department, fire department, they're actively creating the message or the, the actual defining the area. They could pull your message right after you've recorded it. Um, so you can easily do that. And then the settings down here would be um, for additional like social media pages. So let's say underneath the town, we have the police department, fire department has their own Facebook pages and um, emergency management, maybe parks and rec. We want to be able to pick which channels they um, get disseminated to simultaneously. So we can launch to the police department page at the same time the fire department's getting um, that same message and, and so on. So you in the settings, you get to make that uh, determination. I'm going to go ahead and build a new scenario so that you can just get the feel of what that looks like. Again, first thing that's going to be asked is what type of alert is this? What phone number is going to be displayed on those phones? Um, is it emergency or a community engagement? You would easily make that choice. And then how did we want to reach them? What's our audience here? Is it going to be a town-wide call? Is it going to be um, just a mapped out area that we're creating? Contact groups are a combination of both. So you can actually toggle over um, both options here. Now, the searching function does serve a couple of uh, you know, um, purposes. So the app is geographically aware. It was truly built for first responders. So that if you're at the scene of an event, I need, there's a chemical or hazmat situation happening. I need to evacuate everybody um, within a certain radius. It's aware of where I'm located. It'll pinpoint where I am and I can start building from there. But we've seen in cases where um, folks like counties, they need to actually search for a smaller city or um, let's say somebody's on vacation. They're, they're enjoying the sunshine here in, in Florida or um, at the theme parks when, uh, you know, hopefully COVID kind of dies down. Everybody wants to get out. So they're down here, they're vacationing and they need to get on an alert. They can easily use their app. It will um, allow you to search for uh, Willington instead of actually physically being there. Cause again, it's gonna say, hey, you're in Florida. Let's start building around Florida. You can't launch outside of your jurisdiction just so that you're aware. Um, when we first set up your account, we define what your notification boundaries is. And you could go into the system and highlight the entire United States and it will only send out an alert to your jurisdiction. So it'll kind of, it'll erase anything else that's not within your boundaries. So you would make that determination, find it if you need, otherwise it's gonna pinpoint where you're at. And then you can use the different tools over here, whether it's a quick radius, so that's what the circle is. You would select the quick radius, you would push on the screen where that radius needs to start, and you can toggle that up to five miles if needed. Now the polygon allows you to be a little bit more precise with your selection and you would just tap on your screen where you need those points to be. So um, as you're pointing, it's gonna start creating those lines for you, de defining that area. And once you're done, you would save, gives you that count of how many phones, texts and emails are within that geographic area and that you're gonna reach. You would continue to the next options from there. Contact groups, it will show you that same list of all of your contacts, both your resident facing contact groups or lists that you've um, allowed them to subscribe to, and then your staff and employees. So you would be able to select one, multiple, or all if needed. And then the next is going to be okay, creating that message. If you have saved messages in there, you can always reuse them or you can create a new one. And that new message, you'll still determine all of those different channels or paths that you want that message to go out, phones, text, email, social media, you would make that determination here. And then 
start creating that message. Recording your message is super easy. And I highly recommend that, um, you know, you do use your voice when, um, you know, when a situation is, a, is an emergency because folks have a tendency to stay on the line um, and answer a call when they hear a familiar voice as opposed to a text to speech, which may come um, across more as telemarketing and they might hang up. Um, but know that you do have a text to speech option as well. I know some folks aren't comfortable with recording their message they would much rather, you know, type it out and have the system um, play that message for them. Understand that um, the, that's a great option and that the, the text-to-speech engine is very clear in its translation, so it's easy to understand, but it is also very literal. Um, so if you were to type, let's say, 911, in there um, because 911 is an actual number if you put that number all together it will read it as 911 so you would just simply put spaces between the two the the numbers and in, in order for it to emphasize each one separately so always recommend playing it back before launching so you can make any changes like I just mentioned um, if it's necessary. So recording, um, you would have to let the app have access to your microphone and then you would just simply talk into that device, record your message. You can record it as many times as you want. Um, so if you ever have to re-record, maybe had a lot of background noise, feel free to do that. But once you've confirmed, you go to the next option. So you would create your email here, center and subject line, like I'd mentioned before, still customizable into your message in here. And once you've done that one time, you can easily toggle over the message to the other dissemination path. So you don't have to copy and paste it or retype it out multiple times. You can easily just copy it. And um, with the mobile app specifically, there is an expiration for alerts. So this is really great for um, in the event that we do have a situation that's happening and we we expect you know, an update to come out within the hour with new information, you can let that original message um, expire after an hour or be out there up until 24 hours if needed. And then you can have that follow-up, um, you know, go over it instead. So know that you can have that expiration option there. Text again, we're gonna copy that over. And then the final spot is gonna be, again, that's confirmation. So text, emails, everything that we're seeing. You can play back that file again before you send anything out, confirm the email text, and then final step is to launch. Enter in that launch code, send it out, and it's gone. And then you can always you know, view the, the statistics for those alerts as well. So those were the areas that I truly wanted to highlight today and I, uh, be respectful for the, the fact that I had um, you know, expected about an hour and um, wanted to open it up for questions or uh, areas of additional interest that we wanted to kind of take a look at. So I think, Tiffany, thank you so much for going over that with us. Um, this is really, you said we could pull some information um, from general uh, white pages and yellow pages. And I think we know in today's day and age, fewer and fewer people use a, a landline. So it really is, there's a lot of buy-in um, from our community and that would mean a lot of um, work on our end, some advertising and, and some work to get this out there, correct? Um, yes, and we, we do a variety of different um, options to Marketing. help you with that because ultimately your success is our success. So we help you with templates and flyers. Um, we even have sample social media posts and um, give you recommendations on the optimal hours to make those posts where you'll see the most traffic or the most hits on that particular post. So we do work with you. Um, one of the options with the subscription as well is um, a complimentary all call. So what this all call will do is that very first time that um, you're, you know, getting the word out to your to your recipients, this call will be sent to their phones and it'll let them know, okay, this is the tool that the town has selected for your uh, emergency notifications. If you're getting this alert, great, but go ahead and visit our website and sign up additional um, contact points that you wanna be reached at. Cell phones, text messaging, emails that you wanna be notified. And what's great about that option is that you can also sign up for additional alerts. So community engagement. So you can really um, you know, make that outreach uh, more impactful. And then there's also another um, offering with 
with Code Red is the ability to do a text to keyword. Um, now, what that would be is like the keyword could be Willington, for instance, and your citizens could text that keyword to a short code and get your registration link delivered directly to their mobile device. It's not automatically subscribing them just by texting that keyword, but it's providing them that link so that they can add additional information. Because yes, it would be great to capture that text, but really we want more than just that text. We want your phones, we want your emails, we want everything that we could possibly, you know, um, get from you for these types of alerts. Because again, not one specific channel is going to be the best to reach everybody. So um, that is a really great way of getting folks engaged as well as to just promote that keyword out on social media so that they'll get that link and they'll add their information in. Um, it's a more mobile friendly version of that registration page. And is it just as easy to opt out for those folks who leave uh, a particular town? Yeah, so it'll show on that same registration page. And while we're talking about it, I might as well pop it up. So um, I'll bring us to the community notification enrollment page. So over here, um, it could be an area where the town seal or town logo, any type of image that you would like to be displayed here. Your um, town information will obvi obviously be displayed here instead of you know my name. But this is where that would be located. Your citizens have the option to create a managed account or not. We don't want to prevent them or make it as you know hard on them to, to sign up because um, some people will be like, that's one more login and one more password. I have to try to remember, forget this. So they can easily log in as a guest if needed. But on the same page, there's an opt out. So if they ever needed to say, okay, I've moved out of the area. I no longer want to get these alerts. They can easily opt out of the, the um, system as well. I'm going to go ahead and just sign in um, through my Google and let's, oh, bummer, I don't have it. Let's see. <laughs> ah, it's like I don't remember what my words was. Okay, never mind. I'm just going to create a new one. And while I'm doing this, let's see, let's see, let's see. Now, um, with this, I had mentioned that they would add in their first and last name, their addressing information so that when you are in the map and you're, geo you're geo-targeting, they're getting that alert based on where they've um, you know, specified their addresses. They can have multiple addresses in here. So if somebody wants to get notified for their home, but also their work address, or if a parent wants to be notified in the event that a school, like their child's school might be affected by a notification. They can have up to, I believe, four or five addresses um, that they specify. And then they can add up to four phones, four texts, four emails for their that single subscription. We do not restrict how many people, because um, maybe they have four and they want you know additional information. All they would have to do is complete that first registration and then go back with that same address and add any additional beyond that four, because we do not want to stop people from being able to add information in. And some folks might live in like an apartment complex or uh, dorms where they have a single address, but there's the potential for so many more uh, contact points. So all they would have to do is like, like I said, complete that first one and then redo it. Um, and then it will just keep saving those numbers on top of it. And then emails and those additional notifications. So I had mentioned earlier, if you want to get engaged with those um, aging at home programs, community news, dog updates, all of those would be listed for your um, your recipients to be able to then select additional notifications that they want to you know, get from the town. Okay, so that's all from a single page. And then once they're done, they just verify the information. It'll give them a congratulations page. It'll tell them what those uh, caller IDs are gonna be. So for the emergency versus the general, it prompt them to save them if needed. And then also um, give them a link or the QR code to the app so that they and encourage them to download the app on that, that final page as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? If you're muted, you should have the ability to unmute yourself. Can see all from seeing none. Uh, Tiffany, I want to thank you for taking the time um, to come and talk with us tonight. Um, we have much more, but you um, can have the rest of your two hours back. <laughs> I thank you all so much for your you're time welcome. and appreciate it. Thank have a great you so evening. Much. Have a good evening. Bye bye. All right. Um, I know the agenda folks um, said presentation by uh, both. We put them both on. I'm not sure who would be available. And so um, Alex for our next meeting is planning to set up Everbridge. So we didn't have two of them in one night, give ourselves a little bit of a break um, too, and not so much competing.
there. So um, I will uh, move on to item four and then we can kind of talk about this one. So the quote, we had gotten a quote back. Um, I had had the same presentation with Tiffany um, earlier this summer and um, gave us a quote, and I'm not sure I shared it with Alex, I'm not sure if he shared it with all of you, that the annual cost for us was $2,000. Um, and there were alternative pricing plans. $2,500 gave us unlimited emergency plus, and then $3,000 annually uh, was limitless. So um, we have a similar quote from Everbridge, which was significantly higher, um, just to start. So the annual cost um, is less. It certainly gives you the opportunity to do not just emergency contact, but some community um, messaging as well. And I know there was some concern when we, um, back in uh, beginning of June, when we um, touched base after the incident here in Willington that we didn't want on a system that we use maybe to get bogged down with some of that minutia. And this system definitely gives you the ability Mansfield does use code red. Um, Lieutenant Palmer, I don't know how familiar you are with it. When I reached out to Mansfield back in May, um, they used the system, but they couldn't tell me how long it had been. Uh, it's so infrequently used because they really just use it for emergency messaging, which says to me they probably don't use it for weather messaging like Tiffany suggested. Um, do you know if any other neighboring communities use this system? I do not, and uh, no one else, no resident trooper towns and whatnot has given me the code red thumbs up. I've had the app, both Everbridge and code red on my phone, my personal phone for a while, just to try to keep me informed when I travel. So I know there is a significant number of users out there because I see the alerts, but. Okay, yeah, uh, I hadn't in my searching too, Mansfield was um, the, the only one, but again, right. Hadn't used it in a while, so they really couldn't um, tell me. And that's another concern, you know, we should have, whether it be Everbridge, and we'll hear that when we hear the Everbridge presentation, is that there's some um, user uh, friendly issues, right? So if we're not using this all the time, how hard is it to put a message together? How long will it take to put that message together if someone's not utilizing it on a regular basis? So um, with the current Everbridge uh, capabilities we have um, through TN Dispatch, they send it out for us and they're very um, well versed in sending messages, which is something that unless we're using it here all the time, it could take someone quite a bit of time just to get through all the steps that she showed us <laughs> and to get the message out. So that's something to be mindful of as well. Comments? Erica, just on that Mike. point. Yes. At, at my previous place, um, because of that exact problem of how do you keep it efficient when um, things are really tense because that you might often need the system to be used very quickly at a time when the stress is high. So the person using the system is not going to be in their best state of mind, maybe, um, and may not be using the system commonly, like you said. Yeah. So we just basically made, now, of course, we had certain locations where the message was being driven from. So it was easy to have a cheat sheet right there, but we had like a one or two page cheat sheet that had those screenshots that she was showing us printed and laminated so it didn't get messed up and so people would write their little comments on it um and basically you could just take that you could pick up the cheat sheet and say oh that's right step one looks like this step two looks like this and we pre-canned as many messages as we could um and we pre-canned as many locations as we could also like she showed so basically it, it would allow you to speed through the process better you know she described it in great detail and time even with very little practice, you could blast through all those steps very quickly. Right, and with familiarity, you sure. You pick up, you know, the message is there's a weather alert, check your local news, or the message is um, there's an emergency, you know, there's a fire emergency in town, go to that alert website, mm -hmm. um, or whatever the pre-canned message is, and then you select the area. The area is, you know, whatever, it's all of Willington or whatever it is. And, and then it would ask a verification and send. And, you know, so there were only like five steps. You know, uh, what's the message? Where is it going? What services is it going out on? And um, confirm. So what, 
bad once once you just went through it in steps instead of getting all that explanation it wasn't too bad okay i i agree but yeah definitely the the use of it was um something again for us to really be mindful of and watching tiffany go through it and when i saw um um a demonstration at tn as they fly through it they use this system all the time unless we were using it for not general messages and non-emergency notifications, we might not um, have anyone here that's as familiar and, and that again, that it, that it go that quickly. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't, right? It could be somebody just, you know, a, a couple of folks um, job to do that and they'd be able to get through that. So it's not a hindrance, it's just something for us to be mindful of. But again, we have to determine if we purchase a system like this, how we want to use it strictly for emergencies and that is the way in which Mansfield uses it strictly for those emergency issues. Um, we could use it to send internal messages to our staff. We could use it to send internal uh, external messages for um, you know renew your dog license that time of year. Remember to register to vote before October 27th. Remember to vote on November 3rd. So there, there are different uses and I did like the feature and I don't know that Everbridge has that of that phone number that's specific to us. So, hey folks, put this phone number in your contacts because when it calls you, it's the town of Wellington sending you a message, which they can either then choose to respond or ignore because <laughs> yeah. they'll know that it's us. We, we debated this stuff a lot when we decided to use, we ended up using Everbridge in that mm -hmm. environment. And we debated all of this stuff to ad nauseum about, particularly about will you, Will you create a boy that cried wolf situation by doing administrative messages and people will start ignoring it yeah one of the ways that was solved is there were certain policies that were set up of when you would use the system for administrative messages and if it was not an emergency message first of all you you only did it certain times of the day so maybe maybe the decision if we were going to do that here in willington maybe the decision is that 7 p.m is the only time we'll send out administrative messages uh, and at 7 p.m., we send out a message that says there are new updates on the, the town's website, such and such. And you use a website dedicated just for those administrative messages. You know, it could be WillingtonAdministrativeMessages.com. And then people can go to that website anytime. But if you want to trigger them to look at 7 p.m. on Monday night, you say there are new messages on messages.willington or whatever you're going to call it. And you send them there. That way you don't waste much time in the message that goes out to them. It's quick for them to read. They can swipe it off their screen, but if it's an alert, it comes out on the other phone number and it says, here's your alert, here's your important message. And hopefully that separates the, the, the deleting, you know, the ignoring thing. I agree. Any other comments or questions specifically on Code Red? We'll be able to talk more about it when we compare the two and then determine what it is that we want to do. Right. Do, you know, that's our big question is what is our goal um, and do we believe we need something else or just um, more clear cut protocols? Hey, Mike, can I ask you a question? Did you ever send attachments in any of your communications? That was one thing that I did not see there was if you had a written attachment that had, you know, a public statement that you didn't you just want to attach a document. No, for any of that stuff, you would always direct them to another location for two reasons. First of all, it allowed if someone was writing that administrative message, it allowed them to write it and download it onto that specific location almost at the same time you're writing the alert. It also um, greatly reduces the data used because there's a huge amount of data traffic and bandwidth required to pump out a message to maybe 2000 cell phones and yep. you know 2700 emails or whatever the numbers are. Um, so the longer the message it is or the more complicated it is, the more data stream it's using, the slower the system runs, the less reliable the messaging is. Um, so they don't typically do attachments in these Everbridge or um, Code Red things. They drive you to something else. There may be a link, just a link that says, click this for alerts.willington.org or whatever we're calling it. Okay. Um, yeah, and that would drive them to another place to get greater amount of data. Okay. I, I guess that was the other part of my question because I see it in the system we use for the school that when I send a larger message and an hour later it's still calling, right? That's not oh, yeah. what we're looking for in this situation. 
Um, so I'm, I was curious to know if you sent an attachment, what if that was an option too, if it's not, she showed us how quickly it sent those phone messages, mm -hmm. but I can see she like answer, <laughs> right. If it's answered, if it went to voicemail, I can see all those things. I'm just, I was yeah. curious to know if it, and, if you can and her, in the system per se. Her data screen showed that you can see all of those. She, uh, I thought a little more in depth with the, the last um, demo I got from her. And then you also worry if you're sending too much information right. that you lose people in it. It's suddenly, right. if you don't catch them in the beginning, it's less important to them and they might stop listening. Um, and if you buried something kind of important later in a message, so it's, you know, pump out exactly what you need. And if that's, you know, there's an emergency, please visit our website for more information or, you know, in our case, you know, this is um, a direct result and reaction to an incident here. And so giving them this, that basic information and getting that out there. Right. I just was curious how quickly it's going to send out a message to 5,000 phone numbers. I mean, that's the reality, right? That's what yeah. we're looking for. Yeah. And the reality is that, you know, it might be kind of slow. I know that just the ones we get from CT Alert, when they've gone out, um, for instance, a couple of Saturdays ago, um, the governor was going to have a phone call. So, you know, the one I'm talking about. And, and I don't know if that went to everybody that it wasn't supposed to. And it took a while before I get um, from my different phones because I have multiple um, information for me, under my contact name. And it, there was quite a lag between where I get it. And even the normal CT alerts, there's a lag time between when I get it and my email, when I get it, my work phone, when I get it on my personal phone. So it's taking a while and they're pretty basic. We standardize to keep the message size small and to keep for data and use and for keeping the attention of the receiver. We yep. standardized our message to whatever our smallest platform limitation was. And at the time it was Twitter. Um, so Twitter was limited, I think to 265 characters or something like that. Right. Um, so we just had an understanding our messages would never be more than you know 263 characters or whatever. Um, and if you needed any more than that, you had to drive people somewhere else. Now, of course, we had it tied in, like I was asking her about the message that we put out that 263 characters or whatever it was would automatically go to that website as well. So at a minimum, that would show up on the website. If someone else administratively had the time to put more detail on the website, they would do that, which would then give people the opportunity to dig in more to what it was. Fair enough. Thank you. Anyone else? All Erica, right. when you spoke yeah. to uh, Doug, did he make it clear that the town would have access to TN to send out an Everbridge message? Okay. Because what I found through my research at my end is as an organization, we're very um, layered in terms of getting decisions made at times. Mm -hmm. So your access would probably be very vital in an emergency to provide direction to your town through TN without having to wait for, you know, someone in a larger organization to say, Hey, this is a, uh, this is a, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And it, it's coming out very shortly, but you might, you might be quicker. You might be more nimble than a larger organization within the town through TN. So Doug made it clear that you could have access to them. and, and so We, we do have access to them and, and I have sent out messages to them and COVID related messages, but he also made it clear. And I think we discussed this um, on, on multiple occasions that in this particular instance, they would want to make sure that the message we sent out about a, a police investigation was vetted through those, those channels. Um, but yeah, I can pick up the phone and I did during storm, the tropical storm and I mm -hmm. did for COVID and sent him a message, here's my message, and that's what he sent out, and it goes very quickly um, once we get it to them. So we've always had that ability and that system. It's when you start um, discussing if, if I wanted if I wanted to send a message about a state police investigation or if I wanted to send a message about a fire department issue, they might vet it through those. They wanna make sure the messaging jives with the accuracy with either our, you know, our fire department, and we're typically mm -hmm. working in conjunction with them, and in this case, state police. But yeah, right, so like, we, yeah, like we discussed previously, the benefit of that concept would be as soon as information goes out through the state police, it becomes available to you to use. Yes. And then if 
if it's been put out through PIO, social media, whatnot, that information would be available to use in whatever fashion you felt most appropriate. So you could put it, you could use it for for uh, an Everbridge call in that, in that set of circumstances. Okay. Yeah, I think this goes to how we're going to end up using it and what we, what if we end up developing policies or procedures for how we use it. Um, again, in my previous experience, that's part of the reason we did pre-canned messages. We actually had police chief buy-in on a certain group of messages that could be sent out without, without being approved at the moment because that police chief or their command staff might be very tied up. Mm -hmm. and there was an agreement that very basic information was already pre-approved to be released. So let's just say in the example that happened in May, if this we had a pre-approved message situation, it might have been deemed in our planning process that it would have been okay to send a message out right away saying, um, you know, that there has been an incident in some part of town and all members of the public should, um, you know, keep an eye out and report anything unusual or whatever the message is. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be agreeable and maybe the state police will sign off in advance that that's okay, or maybe not. I'm just saying as an example. And right. which is then that tool is at our disposal right away. And that's why I, I'm, I'm kind of asking these questions to kind of, uh, guide the conversation at the local level to what you know what you could offer to me that I can push through the chain of command that says hey in a, in a similar set of circumstances this is what folks are asking for how do we go about facilitating that through existing channels and therefore it may be the template for the entire troop C area the entire state police whatever it may be that's kind of the goal here I, I guess I'm trying to guide the discussion to a point where I can assist whatever decision you make in putting a plan in place that doesn't require an extensive vetting process in an emergency. So those kind of things will be helpful to me to, to bring to my bosses and say, hey, listen, here's the five messages that the town of Willington is interested in having available in the event that we ever have another crisis of this nature. Can you give me your sign off on these? So for future instances, it can go out with without any required approval in the moment because it's already been approved. Yeah, that, those are great examples, Mike. And I don't think things that, that we thought of it. And so to see that they've, you know, worked in other instances, um, you know, it's, it's, it may not be as detailed information, but it gives them something and, and alerts them to be alert, um, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like that, and, you know, coming up with what those are. Do you have some uh, concrete examples, Mike, that you can share with us? Uh, about tonight? I will go other back. If I find the right day with the right people working, I'm sure okay. I can. Get, I'm sure I can dig those out of the system. <laughs> okay, yeah, that might be helpful for us to to guide to what those might messages might be and how they emails. might work. I might even be able to dig through emails four or five years ago. Maybe I can find them. <laughs> this is why we never get rid of emails, right? All right. So um, we also talk. We talk next week. We'll get to um, item five on our agenda, which was discussion on questions and information for residents. Um, Mike, you had talked about bringing us uh, this time several questions um, that we wanted to target uh, residents for responses with. Mm -hmm. I did rough out some questions. Okay. Did uh, you share them with Alex? I, I will email them. Okay. If you, I was going to say, I don't have them. So if you did, he didn't share them. No, no, no. I just roughed them out over the last day or two in okay. advance meeting because I was thinking because it was on the agenda I was thinking we were going to discuss it but I can email it and then he can share it with the group or whatever we can we can discuss them so you want to talk about them now whatever, I mean, I, well I mean there's really I think I only had four questions and I think it's you know it's pretty basic and that was you know what types of if we were asking the community what type mm -hmm. of events do you expect to get emergency communications for and then what types of events would you expect to get administrative messaging for at least you get an idea of the pulse of the community, what they feel like they want to know about. Okay. And then the third question was, what methods of communication um, would you be looking to get this? You know, some people may say, I only get emails or whatever, but we would get a, a, an idea. And then uh, my fourth question was, um, what would your backup method be? And the reason that came to mind was during the storms um, when Christina was um, in office and during events when you were in office, Erica, like in Isaias, we had time periods where certain methods of communication weren't available. 
Um, you know, maybe some people had no internet and no power, so they couldn't look at a web page. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't use it because some people are looking at the web page, but we need to know what people overall find to be their most reliable means of communication or their backup. Um, you know, so like um, we've found that unofficially and even officially using social media has been pretty effective because for the most part, people with cell phones are still able to find a Facebook page or whatever, not always, but you know, sometimes, and uh, there were a few times when I think Christina passed out information during the storm, the only way for a little while to get it out was by Facebook, basically. Um, you know, so that, that was work with what you have at the moment, but if we plan it in this process, then we have a chance to learn what people are looking for. And then if we decide to use it, when we train people on this process, they'll know, oh, my cell, I'm not getting any cell service, but if I can get to Facebook, I can go here. Or if I can get to the internet, I can go here. Yeah, we might find that, you know, we have a, a great cross section that uses Twitter. We do not, the town does not have um, right. that form of communication. And I know it's widely popular. I would say, uh, especially with younger folks, Mm -hmm. And maybe it means we need to up our social media game. Mm -hmm. And that was why I asked what, her what, if she could push to those things automatically yeah. her system, because if you can drive a message to all of them all at once, then, you know, yeah, you, and you can. And when she chose phone, email, others, Facebook and Twitter were right there on that page. Yep. Um, and then the iPods. And I don't know how easy it is to get access to that, having to go through FEMA. I'm unfamiliar with that. So we were, we talked about at our last meeting, we talked about surveying folks with um, the, what it was that they were hoping to get and, and hoping to get uh, look for out of this communication uh, conversation. So does anyone else have any questions or, you know, general comments that we should add to? Sarah, do you have any thoughts? I wonder if we'd want to ask them if they want to self-subscribe or be automatically subscribed, or if we want to split it between don't ask for emergencies because some people might say, no, we don't, we want to send them to them, <laughs> but maybe for administrative and other types of notifications. Right? Or, you know, maybe even how willing uh, would you be to self-subscribe to something like this? I will share with you, and I shared uh, at the last meeting, we went from about 2,300 contacts in the Everbridge system at the, um, in March when I sent out the first COVID alert to the tropical storm when I sent out alert, we were somewhere around 4,500. So there oh. was an increase. Um, in that, and I and I can tell you that the majority of that came after the May incident because I had visited TN and um, I could see what the numbers were at that time. So they were significantly greater after the tropical storm. So we already got some buy-in from residents um, to go ahead and use that system. And that gives them statewide messaging too, not just for Willington. We push out ours, but they have the ability to sign in for statewide alert, um, which is which is important especially during this uh, pandemic time. Anything else in a survey we should be asking to help guide us? Mike, what was your second question focused on? Like, what do you want to know? You're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry. That's OK. <laughs> um. So that was the question of the administrative or general messaging. So the things that aren't emergency alerts, um, you know, maybe we find the preponderance of people in town say, I do not want you pushing through a system administrative stuff. If, if my kids are in school, I'll sign up that way. If I care about what's going on with voting, I'll sign up that way. Or maybe we find there's a lot of people in town that say, I would like the option to get administrative alerts. And we would have to give some kind of examples of what that might be you know it could be bake sale it could be as silly as i don't know silly is not the right word it could be as low Simple. impact as a bake sale mm -hmm. it could be as high impact as remember the election is tomorrow um you know there's a broad range there and there's going to be a broad range of opinions on who wants to know about what right so your, your question is really are you interested in uh in the program whatever is done also having the option to receive administrative or community messaging. messaging. Correct. Okay. Yes. 
So yep. similar to the things that we push out through our website, which we have right. under a thousand folks uh, registered for, um, we could send those in a text message to say, you know, hey, yep. check out our website. There's information on a road closure. You know, see our website. There's new information on, uh, you know, elections. So. Right. Are you interested in things more than emergency? If we get an overwhelming no to some of that, then we know that maybe we don't need to purchase our own system. We can continue to use the system that's available to us. Um, just for emergency. State, just for emergency purposes. Right. Your thoughts, Christina? Or Stuart? Stuart, you there? <laughs> so I, I thought of a question. I forgot okay. to ask the... Uh, Code red demonstrator. Um, did she say earlier in the call how long that would take to get implemented if we were to select it? The system or a, a particular message? The system. She did not. And I don't know as I asked that question. Um, My experience with them in the past is the once you have a contract signed mm -hmm. in who provide them with your information? Like they're gonna say, we need, you know, a information from you. Um, their setup is very fast. They Their geo structure is already built. So they can define the parameters of the town, the boundaries, you know, that's probably it. That's probably a click for their programmers. Um, it's really um, us being able to provide them what they're asking for, you know, administratively and setup wise. Okay. I can, uh, I'll pose that question to Tiffany in a follow up and just get you, I get us an answer. I imagine there's a training component to that agreement as well, right? Yeah, I would hope so. Because <laughs> that, that wasn't nearly enough. <laughs> you know, I will say that when uh, Robin and I sat through her demo with us and we felt really great about a lot of things that it could give us as a community more so than just the um, emergency system. And, um, but, you know, again, there's a, a cost, an annual cost associated the, to that. And so we need to make sure we're using it. And if we used it just for the emergency aspect, and that's what we're thinking, the reality is we have something like that at our disposal. So would we want to purchase something that just kind of sits and collects dust? Um, it just means that we can hit the send button instead of sending it forward to someone else. I'm just making myself a note. How much? Is your free version that you're referring to as targeted? Oh, me? Well, uh, well, it's is it as targeted? So it's there's still sign in, uh, there's still buy in from from folks, so it would still take no, no. marketing. I guess I mean she was showing us when you was sending oh. she was sending a message. She could target a street. Do you have that same capability through through whatever is it whatever, whatever we currently have that's that's quote unquote free? Well, through Everbridge. Right. So if you send to Everbridge, do, though, do you yeah. have a choice to send to only old old Farms Road, or do you have to send to everybody? No, we we do, and we'll hear from them uh, next time. Yep. But yes, they have the same ability to narrow or expand the scope. Um, but the reality is currently the way we use it is when we're sending out a townwide message. Oh, okay, thank you. We haven't uh, used it in that sort. And that's what our own system might give us the ability to something a little less emergent, something, um, for instance, we have water here, right, from senior center up to center school. Do we make that an alert? And then there's water for folks down in the hall school and village area. And that's something you might want to send to them. I don't know that as a town, we would use that system in order right. to push that out. Our own system, we would. Right. And I believe Talon uses theirs in a similar fashion to be able to do those kinds of things. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, and just for um, uh, conversation purposes, this came up when we had our follow-up. Um, after the incident in May, both um, our, all of our surrounding towns that have resident state troopers, Mansfield, um, Stafford, and Tolland that felt concern in their area, they too have, um, they have their own systems, so they have access to just put out a system. 
um, through the resident state trooper. They didn't put um, anything more than we did, again, because the messaging in that instance would have come from the state police. So that goes back to Mike, our, you know, if we have this canned response that's already agreed upon, we can just kind of hit the button on that. Um, and they would have done the same thing. So they had a system at their disposal, not waiting for anyone else to use and didn't utilize it in this instance. So I think I'm going to, um, I think I want to try to navigate the generic statement from critical incident to notification from, a, from the state police perspective. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to the major crime personnel that work at the barracks and try to craft, say, five messages that would be life safety, uh, immediately shelter in place, notify uh, law enforcement of any unusual contact to, um, you know, some sort of far less critical incident that still warrants notification. And I'll see if I can come up with verbiage that would satisfy uh, internally the expectations. And then I'll bring that to the next meeting to have a discussion about, you know, are these statements sufficient? And therefore, uh, that gives you your template to operate from no matter which system you decide to go with. And I will try to get the ones from my previous um, place, which, you know, hopefully can be uh, similar, very similar to that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, we talked about these questions um, and wanting to get some sort of survey out to folks um, sooner rather than later. So do we think we can take the questions you have, kind of put them into a more formal survey and start uh, pushing that out? Or um, do we, do you want to talk about it at our next meeting and give it- Erica, do you want me to formal? take, do you want me to take the four questions I had plus the fifth one that we just mm -hmm. talked about, um, which is the self-subscribe versus forced subscription. You want me just, I'll email those to the group. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, maybe someone can draft up kind a- Kind of wordsmith them a little bit. A survey monkey or something and have it, you know, not launch it, but have it ready for the next meeting. You betcha. Yeah, so we'll send them out and we can kind of do some, some, some wordsmithing. And work I'll email them. them to the group. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I will mention that we are down. So Sarah is uh, and Christina represent our, our community members. Um, I have not heard from Vincent Pagano, but unfortunately Joe Kennedy wrote to us and his work um, uh, commitments have um, caused him to have to withdraw. So he is, um, he works in medical field and as you can imagine right now, the demand mm -hmm. um, are higher than I think he anticipated. So he unfortunately um, withdrew his name so hopefully uh, they're here to represent the, the community at large and um, give us some feedback there. Stuart, do you have anything you wanna comment on? We can unmute if you're uh, the O2 phone. Wait, I'm guessing he does it. The, the last item on our agenda was um, to review the surrounding town notification protocols. Um, I can't remember my uh, notes don't show if that was Alex or uh, that was getting those back to us. And so I haven't seen anything yet. And again, I don't remember. I apologize. He had a, a personal matter um, he, that, that took, kept him away tonight. So we'll move that forward um, to our next meeting. Just going ahead and looking at the protocols for these specific systems that our neighboring towns use will give us some insight if we choose to go with our own system and um, help us take a look at how they utilize them, where and when. All right, so hopefully I think we'll hear from someone um, next time around. That brings us to when we should meet again. Do Wednesdays seem to work for folks? Wednesdays are fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we can do Wednesday the 4th, which is two weeks from tonight, or Wednesday the 18th, which is four weeks. The preference, anyone? I didn't have a special do BOE meeting on the 4th. On the 4th? Okay, so let's go with Wednesday the 18th of November. But it seems like a long ways away, but the 11th is uh, Veterans Day, so I didn't know how many folks would be available. I mean, it will be. But... 
if I'm not. All right, so we'll um, set something up for the 18th. Mike is going to get us um, his questions. We'll start working on those, have those ready to go. And I will reach out to Tiffany and ask her um, the implementation link uh, questions there that you have. Thanks. Would Anything it be else? helpful for me to um, set up a Google folder for the committee that we can drop documents and share, you know, you can put feedback on, is that helpful? I think so. I don't know how many are, yeah. So if you get a, if you get an email from me that just says here's a Google folder, I can put it in there. Bill is where I go to when I need the Google Drive information. He's well versed in it. <laughs> All right. So if we have nothing else, I will in the dark here uh, <laughs> make a motion to adjourn at eight thirteen. Second. Mike second, even in his muted capacity. All right. All those in favor. Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you for your time. <laughs>